welcome to Behind the Incident. It is my distinct honor to have Eric Zimmerman on. Um, he is, in my opinion, one of the leading tool creators for DFIR folk. He makes our lives so much more pleasant and easier. Um, welcome to the show, Eric. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. So tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into the line of DFIR, um, your experience and what you get up to in your daily life. Sure. Um, well, I mean, I, I got into digital forensics kind of as a, a secondary role when I was an FBI agent. So I went I went uh, to the FBI Academy in September of 2007 and graduated in 2008. Uh, and so as soon as I got to Salt Lake City, which is where I was stationed, um, I was on a cyber squad and I also did a lot of work. Most of the work was uh, dealing with crimes against children stuff. Uh, and as a result, you're going through lots of computers and you're seizing computers and you have lots of evidence to go through to try and find uh, primarily pictures and videos in that world. Um, but also what was open, when it was opened, all of the evidence of execution, kind of the, the bread and butter of what most forensics uh, taskings are going to be. What ran, what was opened, who did it kind of a thing. Um, and so as a result, really hadn't done any any kind of formal forensics prior to probably 2009, maybe, uh, and then got into, started looking at different tools. And of course, the FBI has RCFLs, the Regional Computer Forensics Labs, and they have all the tools. Um, and so you start looking around, and I, I kind of fell into the, the marketing at first with, oh, well, end case is what you, you, you have to do end case because it's court approved and all the, the normal stuff that you hear. And so that's really where I started was NK6, um, did the training and got my NCE and then started looking at other tools. And I had always used WinHex. Um, and then you look at X, uh, X-Ways Forensics and then you look at the website and it looks like it was created eight hours after HTML was invented. Uh, and you say, well, how how good can it be? Like it, it doesn't, this was before you kind of use it and then the, the, the scales fall off your eyes a bit as far as getting indoctrinated in one of these tools. Um, and so I got it and I fought with it and kind of progressed into using that as my primary tool. And then around the same time, I was on a task force, called ICAC, the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, and they had a need to be able to triage computers better. And back then there were very few tools. There was a program called Image Scan. Um, there was, uh, another one that you ran on a Windows system and it would just show you thumbnails of pictures, but it, unless you had like insane reflexes, you were never fast enough to pause it to be able to see what it was showing you and you couldn't go back and it just, it didn't do anything but just show you pictures. And so I had had some programming experience prior to going into the Bureau. And so I was, uh, also kind of the resident nerd. And so they're like, hey, can we come up with a better way to do this? And so that's where OS Triage version one, kind of the betas were born in, well, we need a way to look at images and videos on these computers fast, either in the field or in the lab. And so that's what it did. And then after it did that pretty well, somebody's like, well, what about browser history? Oh, well, like, I guess I can add a tab for that. And, and then what about link files? And then what about uh, registry and then what on and on and on and pretty soon you have 47 tabs um, with everything in a cohesive way that anybody with literally 15 minutes on the phone could use uh, and so that's okay. how OS triage one came about and then two came about where it was less it was more modular um, and so that progression into forensics out of necessity uh, coupled with kind of my background I prior to the bureau I, I was I did IT stuff but it was uh, systems management and application integration and stuff like that. So uh, as I had that programming background and then bringing that skill set into, well, how do we do this and make tools that are going to be streamlined for what we actually need to do? Uh, and then it just rolled into there. The first probably public tool I think I did, kind of branching out from that closed source uh, private type stuff, I, I want to say was was maybe Shellbags Explorer at one of the DFIR conferences in Austin uh, after Dan Pelega's talk. Um, and awesome research, but it's like, there's gotta be a better way to present this data. And then that's where things started 
going as far as, well, okay, I could write a tool for that. And then, well, that, that no one understands this. So let's go look at this and, and on and on and on. Um, it's funny when you start and I, people can identify with this. I think, you know, you look at anybody that has been doing this a while or, or is comfortable doing it. You're like, man, those, they he really knows what he's talking about or she really understands file systems. Well, there was a time when we didn't. And I remember distinctly when I was writing OS triage, I'm like, well, what, what is a link file? I look at the link file in a hex editor and you're like, there's no way I'm going to be able to, why, who can understand this? But you can, if you put the time in and look up and do the research and figure out what you want to figure out. Um, and so is, is it a higher bar than other things? Of course it is. Is it impossible? No, it's not. And so now I look back and it's like, I want to find those things to try and write my own code because I, certainly not because I just want to reinvent the wheel or I have nothing better to do. I, I think that there's value that can be added even to quote unquote solve problems like NTFS or MFT parsing or fill in the blank problem. Um, and at the end of the day, there's really no better way to learn how an artifact works than to, to write a parser for it so that you really get into the nuances of it. Not from just uh, wielding it and saying, look, here's the files that were open. But from a testimony perspective, no, here's how it's stored. Here's how it works. This means this means this. It just adds to credibility, um, which kind of overflows into a lot of the other, I don't know, my teaching style and everything else, but I'm sure we'll get there. So kind of a long-winded answer for how I got into forensics, but <laughs> that was the progression. Basically necessity. Uh, and then it was like, yeah, I kind of like doing this and just got more and more into it. Um, I think one of the first tools that I did use of yours was your shell bag explorer. And we had a, a instance where a very smart, savvy technical person was deleting um, evidence. Um, but as he had a USB drive inserted, he used to navigate these files that he removed off the company computer and supposedly wiped. But with shell bags, I was able to reconstruct exactly what was removed from the machine. Mm -hmm. And that was pretty epic, you know, using something like that, that, you know, it just works. There's no mm -hmm. latency, it's it's straightforward. And and that's what I like about your tools. They, they fast to the point. I don't have to watch a little circle daddling around and around waiting for evidence to come back. Um, mm -hmm. Because I, I find tools can be very pretty, but pretty useless. Uh, and that that's my biggest, issue with some commercial products is yes they look phenomenally beautiful they do excellent reports but those are all things bells and whistles we don't necessarily need um a hex editor excel one of your tools and the job's done the, one of the things with i mean both sides of the equation either designing code and it it, it does this but it doesn't do it very fast now, I would obviously prefer slow and accurate over fast and not accurate, right? They say speed is fine, but accuracy is final. And so is there a balance there? Yes, there's a balance there. But that doesn't mean that it's just, well, let's just add something in and put in no engineering whatsoever and then say we support feature X. Even though it might take eight hours to run to get you the same answer, a different tool might get you in three minutes. Uh, the problem with a lot of the, and this this isn't a unique problem to digital forensics, is you don't know what you don't know. If you if you aren't out there looking for different ways to do things, you won't use them. If you aren't, and and this is the problem too, a lot. If you aren't taught something, if somebody doesn't set something down in front of you, the royal you, not of course you or, but in general, people tend to only want to use what somebody said to use, or to that somebody has gone through the training. At least in my experience, I, I, I've not been in the private sector as long as I was law enforcement, but that seems to be a very typical mindset is, well, I was trained on tool X, FTK, end case, whatever. That's the tool I'm going to use. Even if it doesn't work, yep. Well, why would you do that? Because that's like, there's a, there's a roadblock there for whatever reason where they don't either want to go find something or they're unwilling to try something new uh, for whatever reason. And a lot of that goes back to my philosophy when I teach is that I'm not interested in teaching you how to use my software. That is a secondary or tertiary goal. 
My goal is to have you understand the data that's being processed because if you understand the data and how it lives and how it works and what it looks like, then the tool just becomes a means to an end. And if a tool does break, you at least now have a chance to step back and go, wait a minute, this was a heavily used machine. There's no way that this jump list only has three files in it. You open it up in a hex editor and you see page after page after page of, of data. Now you at least knowing what a jump list looks like and how it's structured and it's a collection of link files and so forth can potentially go research and do look at other tools to do a cross comparison to say, oh, the tool I was using, it doesn't understand the new format. But if you don't have that, that kind of push, at, at least at the beginning, to say, don't, don't get hung up on using a tool, learn about the data itself, right? Learn the bottom, learn the manual way, and then you automate up. Because then when things start falling apart at the top and you're automating, you at least have a chance to go down a, a tier to be able to solve that problem. Um, is that getting better? I, I don't know. It, it, I guess it's it's kind of you're only going to be able to see that in your immediate orbit, uh, whether it's at the company you work for, the people that you associate with, either online uh, or otherwise. But I think that's really at the heart of where we have a lot of issues is we just get these blinders on for a given tool, and that's all we know. Uh, to our detriment so and uh, that is very true i mean i learned a valuable lesson when i went for the um, bcfe training in florida um where the majority of your work and calculations is done by using a hex editor it's understanding mm -hmm. what you are looking at and mapping out a file system and attributes you know the difference between fat x fat and ntfs and i think that gave me a foundation to understand exactly what my tool is passing out and identify in a commercial tool where NTFS records were passed out wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, are you going to look at, a, at an MFT and a hex editor when you do a case? Nope, probably not, right? Unless something goes catastrophically wrong and it's horribly damaged, you're probably never going to do that. But if you don't know what a standard information attribute looks like or, or the file inf file name attribute looks like, how are you going to adequately explain why you figured out time stomping and all those other things other than a tool said, which you're going to get killed on the stand. I ran a tool and it told me the answer was seven. How do you know? I don't, but that's what I was trained, right? There's going to be a potential issue there depending on who's cross-examining you um, or who you're reading your report or that opposing expert. So um, putting in the effort up front is certainly going to pay off in the long run uh in in many different ways so um what are you up to these days i know you are a sans instructor mm -hmm. um you in private sector at the moment or are you still doing government work no my my full-time job is with kroll cyber and so my my primary role with them is research and development so i do um custom custom software development or uh, I can extend out certain tools. I mean, CAPE was originally written as an internal tool that we use to kind of automate a lot of different processes, standardize collections, and uh, immediately generate actionable intelligence against the, whatever your data set is so that we don't have to worry about this person's been in the game eight years, and they know about six evidence of execution artifacts. This other person in the game just graduated college, and they've only heard of prefetch. Well, by standardizing and just running evidence of execution across a data set, that person, when they go look for prefetch, is also now going to be exposed to shim cache, AM cache, user assist, and any other evidence of execution artifact. Now, they might look at that and go, what, what is user assist? I never heard of that. Then the process starts. They go do some research. They ask a question. Oh, that's this, this, this. But if they're grepping through data, looking for their smoking gun, and it's not in the place where because they only knew how to dump prefetch, it kind of balances the scales and brings people up to a more equal plane without them having to know to run 10 different things. So if your process looks like that, you can quickly do that across larger sets of data without uh, too much trouble. So that started as an internal tool. And then I was able to, of course, get it released to the public. Uh, and here we are from Cape perspective. Uh, and so I, I kind of consider CAPE to be OS triage version three, if you will, just from that progression of my live response tools and, and, and basically uh, 
data processing and the glue. Uh, and this becomes more of a scalable uh, approach than me having to write in a, a plugin that has a tab and a GUI and everything else. Different, in, different type of investigative need, less technical, needs a consistent way to look at 15 different artifacts. With CAPE, the individual gets to choose what gets pulled, what gets run, how it gets out, command line stuff. And so you don't need me. You get to make your own roads, drive whatever car on there you want, and it has nothing to do with me. Short of fixing bugs or adding some underlying feature, um, you can make your own targets and modules and all that. So that all was born out of necessity with Kroll. Um, and so I'll also do things like design training and give training. And um, if people have problems where we have this, I have a ton of data or I don't know how to parse this file, it's some unique thing, I'll take it, reverse it, write custom code and then they'll use it on that case. So I, I, I do some case-related stuff here or there, but it's not my primary thing. Uh, and then there's the usual infrastructure management and, and lab processes and all those kinds of things as well. The SANS teaching is uh, also I'm a SANS instructor, and I, I tend to do that, eh, I don't know, once a month or so, depending on the, the time of the year. That's roughly how it, it averages out, maybe 10 times a year total. Um, and so I'm doing 508 primarily. That's what I've been doing since I left the Bureau in 2015. I started teaching soon after that. Um, and then, uh, of course, we have written 498, 4498, um, and taught that once. It is beta 1, and it went very well in Virginia. And we are getting ready for beta 2, which will be taught at the DFIR Summit here coming up at the end of July. So tuned up the slides, tweaked the labs a little bit based on our first round of feedback. Um, so we're really excited about that, uh, getting that out of uh, just continuing on, on the progress through the betas and then into uh, you know non-beta status. Um, and so really good feedback so far, and we cover a wide range of topics in there that um, traditional courses have kind of shied away from because acquisition can be hard. There's so many variables, and so I think we've we've found a way through several iterations before it really got onto paper is how we can demonstrate and show the techniques uh, without having to have 30 Surface tablets in the room or everybody gets a Mac or f 10 different kinds of phones and all these things. So mm. we, we've come up with a unique approach to do those kinds of things. So Kroll's full-time. Sans uh, as as I need to, and then I, I work in the evenings when I'm teaching. Um, th that's really it. I do a little bit of of training for law enforcement on the side, but that's generally like for free. If if somebody wants X ways training and they can get a room of 40 people, and they give me 10 sp 10 spots for crawl people, I'll go down there and teach um, because then we're giving back uh, f to the community, and I'm still able to get my coworkers trained. Um, which is what they want to do as well. So it, it, it works out to pretty well for everybody. Now, look, I'm also ex-law enforcement. I um, spent a significant, um, I started my career in law enforcement. Um, also someone that was just technical that got ramped up into the digital forensics lab. Um, and I must say, I think the worst case that I worked on where triage saved my life was what in South Africa, we have what is called the dawn raid. We effectively have 24 hours to forensically image um, all the evidence. Nothing should leave site. It's on site. And I walked in where there was suspectedly 20 computers prepared for 20 computers, ended up with 58 and two servers and 24 hours to do it. Mm -hmm. I literally understanding the case and just grabbing what I needed to grab is what's saved my skin on that case, um, not having to do full disk images. Um, I don't think I have done any full disk images for years. It's been triaged images for a couple of And I think that's the real game changers that we've evolved from doing just a full disk image and examining everything, knowing where our evidence lies. Yep. And, and that's one of the tenets of our course. And I think just this philosophy, and we're by no means the, the creators of this philosophy. I mean, this has been around a long time, um, but you, even if you did a full forensic image, what percentage of the data do you actually look at? One to two percent, maybe. And so what we're advocating, and I think 
what I'm hearing you say is that that's what you've been doing is let's just, well, what, why do I care about the other 98, 99%? Show me the stuff I'm going to look at, even if you give me a full disk image. I want registry, I want file system, I want link files and jump lists and all the other things that tell me the story about what a user did, what they opened, when they opened it. That's, that's what we need. I don't care about all the other stuff you're never going to look at anyway. And that going back to what we said before with shell bags. If, if shell bags is essentially a GPS for a file system. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to know about how a person interacted with a computer using the shell, of course, if they're doing command line stuff, the game changes a little bit. But start with shell bags. Don't get to it maybe if you get bored or you, you've, you run out of leads. Start there because if you can see the 82 folders that somebody went to, do you care about the 129,000 other directories that they didn't? Maybe you don't ignore them, but you can now prioritize and look for in the locations where a bad guy went to be able to prioritize. And that's really what triage is about. We will never, I think, at least in certain circles, get away from full disk imaging. Like law enforcement, it's just going to be that way for a long time to make full disk images, at least in the U.S. with, you know, the FBI or whatever. But so we're not saying with with battlefield forensics or whatever you want to call it to replace full disk imaging. But what we're saying is supplement it before you start your full disk image. Do a triage collection. Run some. What, what kind of case are you working? Do you have a standard approach for what you're looking for? Even if you have a generic one for all cases, registry, file system, uh, event logs, link files, jump lists, and so on, that stuff coming out, now you can work your case for three hours while your tool sits there and makes a full disk image or longer. And you have three hours of, of, of analytical process done. Uh, and to what, you're, to what you were saying, if you have 10 computers, where do you start? If time doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. But if you have a limited window because of um, something as extreme as a bomb going to go off all the way down to, well, we just have to get this done because of the law, um, you have to prioritize. Where am I going to spend my time to get the most out of it? Just like you would in the field if you have a bunch of people that are injured, you get to the critically injured people first. Look for the computers that are going to move your case forward the most and deal with those in order. Do you want to look at the 10th one? Sure. Now, there's plenty of times where if we went into a search warrant and there was 15 computers, I walked out with three. Just because you can take everything doesn't mean you should. Do I want to deal with 15 computers? No. Do you? Does the, does the person on the other end who's, who had nothing to do with the case, do they want me to take all 15 computers? No. They're mad. I have extra work. Makes no sense. So if I could look at the computers and figure out this has nothing to do with it, it's password protected. It's in a separate room. The person had no access to it. I'll search through it. And if there's no evidence at all that it has anything to do with it, why do I want to take it? Uh, and so those things helped us. We pushed that out into our training uh, with ICACs and the FBI and things like that to make that a little bit more efficient. But I think there's still a lot of room to be gained <clears throat> with that technique in a lot of different uh, circles in this community. Um, one thing that I always, when I am um, training interns, is like everyone goes, oh, acquisitions, oh, it's so boring. But I always say to them, it's the most fundamental, important step to any case, because if that is a mess and your image is not valid, no one can do the DFIR work. If your collection and preservation is just not up to scratch, there's nowhere to go from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's but certainly no... There's certainly no magic wizardry happening from a from an imaging perspective. Once you start it, watch the little bar go across. But if it's wrong, <laughs> everything from that point forward is affected. So yeah, it's absolutely critical, even if it's not the most glamorous uh, step in the process. So um, um, DFIR Summit. Um Beta 2 is happening on 498. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a little sneak peek into 498? What can, who should attend and what can they expect? Sure. Uh, well, I mean, I would say anybody that would be, anybody can attend, regardless of your stage in life in this field, uh, you're going to get something out of it. Now, there, with that said, 
there's going to be portions of it where you might feel, well, this is pretty basic. And why is it basic? Because you've been doing it for 10 years. Um, you've probably made a lot of forensic images. And if you live in the mobile forensics world and you've processed hundreds of phones, acquiring your Android phone is going to be kind of like, eh, look, yay, so what? And so, but there's going to be other things that maybe you've not done from CAPE to cloud acquisition to all these different things. So our overall goal uh, is to basically acquire data, process it to get to some type of actionable intelligence in 90 minutes, regardless of the source. Um, and so the, again, that could be email, that could be a network collection, that could be um, Dropbox or anything like that. It could be phones. Now, what kind of stuff do you want to prioritize off of a phone? Call history, text messages, uh, maybe contacts, things like that. Off of a computer, the key things we talked about, what was opened, who opened it, um, either from files or folder perspective. So you're going to get kind of intermingled in throughout the course of acquisition, acquiring everything from regular PCs and pulling out hard drives. But what, what about when you can't? Do you know how to image a Surface, a Surface Pro? where you can't take the hard drive out unless you're never gonna put that thing back together, how do you do it? And so we go through and we show you things like dealing with the tablet, dealing with Apple and all the other different things between core storage and, uh, and uh, APFS and all the other nuances. And what we've done is we have, we talk through the slides, but obviously we're not gonna have people acquire something and watch the progress bar for three hours. Um, and we also understand that you aren't going to necessarily go back and start doing all these things immediately every, every day. So it's just rote. And so we've made high quality, professionally produced videos that show how to acquire all these individual devices. What is a write blocker? How do you hook it up? Why do you want to use it? Here's the steps for a Surface. Here's the steps for an Apple. Here's the steps what a hard drive repair might look like. It's not so much that you're going to be able to walk out of class and replace the PCB on a hard drive, but you now know if you run into a situation, what you can do, you have the tools to be able to go, I remember we can do this, this, this is what's possible. Doesn't mean you're gonna do it. Just like you talk about chip off, you're not gonna be desoldering stuff and oh, look what I did. Like there's some expertise that goes beyond familiarity. And so everything from computer devices to smartphones to physical memory, checking for encryption, interspersed with all the acquisition is how do I process and look at data? And so we do different types of collections and we might look at um, <clears throat> tools like Axiom or uh, Celebrite. And how do we look at a phone and extract out who called this person at what time? We have you extract your own data as practice, but then we also have canned pre-cooked data, if you will, so that everybody can look at the same thing and get, oh, there was 10 calls made, three of them went to Eric and so on. And so interspersed throughout that you get some analytical steps like those the key things that you might want to have answered on a case the battlefield forensic part of it we intersperse in between uh all of the different types of acquisitions so that it's not just um death by powerpoint or watching videos for four hours a day so the labs are there's over 700 pages of labs and so it is a, is a significant amount of time of hands-on in the trenches work where it's not just you watching Kevin or I or any of the instructors go through and talk about stuff. It's like, here's the, here's the, the ramp up in the intro. Let's go collect AWS. And you get to see and practice it so that you have, I went through and I did this and I know how it works. I went through and I saw this. I know how it works. So you get the validation piece and you get the how to do it piece all in one. We kind of deep dive into a little bit here or there, but because of the nature of it and how much stuff is in here, it's a six day course without a, a day six challenge. And so it is six full wow. days of, of material. There isn't like, okay, we're gonna collect and, and you're on your own for the last day. Um, and so it's, it's pretty much full throttle the whole time. But that's generally the, high, the highlights. I mean, we also try to go beyond, well, what do you do when a tool fails? What do you do when data is damaged? Are you out of luck? No, so we talk about stream carving and how do I fix a JPEG and repair a Word doc to make it actually open up. And so we get a little bit into that, again, with the expectation of this isn't something where you're gonna walk out of here and be a, a complete wizard in this, it's six days. 
but you're going to gain the familiarity and have the understanding of what's going on to be able to say, no, I, I know I'm comfortable with doing this, or I can at least ask the right questions to be able to be successful in this <clears throat> across a wide range of operations, the stuff that we felt is going to be the most important for the majority of the cases out there, even niche stuff, crazy sands, goofy EMC storage, all of those kinds of things where you may run into it once ever in your career. But if you do, you at least have some tools to be successful on uh, a technique for how you're actually going to go about getting data off of there. And mo a lot of the times in those situations, it's not going to be using some tool you've been trained on or there's a vendor that did a certificate for it. You might be coming up with some eight stage process to get data off working with three different people to be able to start making sense of this. And as that's the, the world that we live in, there isn't a tool for everything. Um, and so we always, we drive home search warrant safety and, and scene safety in general, not just search warrants, but how do you document a scene? How do you maintain a proper chain of custody so that you don't have to deal with that down the line? What should you bring to a scene? What should you leave with on a scene? How do you handle all of those things from an inventory to controlling the evidence, to keeping it secure, all of those things. <clears throat> and so again, depending on your level of expertise, what your background is, is there some parts that are gonna be like, yeah, I've done this before, sure, right? But as a, as a baseline course where you're getting the acquisition and then starting to ramp up into the more formalized processing, that base foundation is what we focused on a lot, giving people a feel for all the different types of things. If you want to, oh, I really like network collection. That's a whole separate genre. I like dead box. I like live response. I want to do incident response using um, host-based stuff like carbon black or tanium. You get exposure to all those things, and then you can kind of decide how you want to specialize from there. So everybody's going to get something out of this. Um, and, uh, of course it'll, it's going to be a dynamic thing and we'll continue to add and, and update and make sure that the materials current as Apple changes or windows changes or, uh, all the different things with how you go about acquiring and what are the, the catches if you do it right or wrong <clears throat> and so on. So it's, it's been well received by people from 20 year veterans. And it's been like, I just, somebody told me I had to go take this course. Everybody likes it, gets something out of it. We've had really good feedback so far. So we're really looking forward to getting it out there and, and available to more people because both of them have sold out so far. Um, even even ex opening up the class for the summit beyond the beta numbers, it's it's sold out. So it's it's exciting stuff. No, it definitely is. I think it, it is one of those SANS courses that whether you've been doing it for 20 years or doing it for a year, you are going to walk away with a new perspective on looking at acquisitions. I think it will blow your mind and show you that the little world that you've been living in with your acquisitions is so much broader and there's so much more that we can get. Um, I mean, a couple of years ago, cloud forensics was a foreign term for us and all research were done about jurisdiction and how do you obtain the evidence. And now it's become a daily part of of any DFIR person's job. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I think this course is the first of its kind that I've seen that actually focuses on acquisitions and triage and getting to the information fast. Um, and that's quite exciting for me. Yeah, and, and there's a reason why you don't do acquisition in the Mac course, for the SANS Mac course. There's a reason why you don't do acquisition in the smartphone course, because it's so, dynamic and different and potentially difficult, it's hard to do. Um, and so it's traditionally something that hasn't been directly covered in those. It, it's more focused on how do I get data off? Well, we want to bridge that gap between seizure to getting the data off. We want to operate in that middle ground or the more the front half of it to be able to adequately and properly collect the data, gain that initial intel up to the point where you can now pivot into the uh, the more formalized processes that have been around a while with the different tools and techniques and vendor, uh, either vendor or open source tools that uh, that are out there and have been out there and kind of matured over the years. So, you know, we, we give you things like a, a write blocker and you'll get a little USB hub and F response consultant edition and, and some 90 day or 128 day licenses for things like 
uh, Axiom and, and Celebrate. So you get to play around with some of those things, but you also get a lot of open source tools and a lot of exposure to other things that you can use so that you have uh, choices, right? It's always nice to have choices. Um, and so the more you have, too many can be uh, kind of on the other side of the spectrum, but showing you different ways to do things, you get to now make the best choice. I like to use GUIs. I like to use command line. There's going to be a, a way for, for you to move forward regardless of your preference. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Cape. So can you tell everyone just, because now I, I always refer to Cape as the game changer these days, because what's amazing is it, it integrates with Soft Elk, which for me has been a very valuable source of analytics. And now having the Cape information integrate with Soft Elk, mm -hmm. um, do you think that is a game changer in the DFI Aura Zone for people using it? Sure. I mean, I think it can be. I mean, when you start doing stuff at scale, and the more scale you do, the harder it's going to be to go through a bunch of CSVs. And so by extending our tools to be able to emit JSON in a sane way, uh, and this has been a balancing act for me. This isn't something that, like, out of the box, uh, I had to work with Phil and, and other people who basically said, that it's too much. My whole goal with JSON at first was, you want the JSON, you're going to get every single property field, everything regardless. Well, that is potentially hundreds and hundreds and, and hundreds of megs of JSON data for a typical MFT versus getting the JSON representation of what you're going to be looking at if you dumped to a CSV, for example. And so working with Phil and, and, uh, and other people to be able to say, make it look like this, what we've done over time has gone away from everything down to instead of a CSV output, you get the CSV data, but in JSON format, which then allows you to start ingesting things, whether it's five machines or 5,000 machines, into Elastic or Splunk or fill in the blank big data system to be able to gain those efficiencies of, I want to know about if there's anywhere in my environment that has a file named foo.exe, well, now I don't have to go deal with grepping across the file system and I can cross correlate between different link links in my data. So I think really to, there's two parts to it. The JSON going into those kinds of systems is certainly uh, an added benefit to it. Um, I think the primary benefit of CAPE is, is just a, a, a vendor agnostic, user agnostic tool from my perspective. It, it does nothing on its own. It does exactly what you tell it to do. Now, I give you a whole bunch of stuff that you can do out of the box to serve as examples in a framework if you don't want to have to build your own. But if you go back and look at the Cape Files repository on GitHub, you'll see just how quickly the community picked up and embraced and started contributing back new file, new targets, new modules, things like <clears throat> I never would have considered. All these things, why did they do that? Because it's important to their case. It's important to their workflow. It's important to their boss. It has nothing to do with me, um, but you don't need me anymore to be able to make your job easier, your job more consistent, your job more thorough. Um, and that's really, for me, the, the biggest win, uh, at least like personally and professionally, to be able to allow people to craft their own solution that makes sense for them, as opposed to, well, you should do it this way because that's how I would do it. Uh, I tried to not go into those kinds of things. Now, of course, there's always going to be guardrails in any kind of a system, but I've tried to make the, the road wide enough that you really aren't going to be <clears throat> limited by what the tool is going to force you into. Um, and so from a collection perspective, there's really, how do you want to use it? Do you want to run on endpoint and pull files back to a central location and then you run modules on it? That's uh, sure. You could do that. If it's a live response and you want to run memory capture and dump, um, Netstat and DNS cache, you could do that too. So it's all about what you want to do, how you want to use it, what kind of case you have. But by coming up with standardized targets and standardized module processing, you can get the same results every time, every time, every time, which is one of the kind of core pillars of repeatable process. So it's not like, well, I ran the tool 10 times and I have eight different answers. Why? Can you explain that? Uh, and so by Coming up with a standardized way to do things, now you don't have, if you tell 10 people to go do live response, you're going to get 12 different ways. 
people come up with. But if you say, here's a standard approach <clears throat> for how we do things, it becomes that much more consistent and you lose some of those kind of outliers where people are like, why would you ever want to do that? Well, why not? I just, just, I thought that was a good idea at the time, kind of an approach. So that's really where I see it bridging the gap and kind of extending people out is, is providing a means to glue separate processes together in a cohesive way that makes sense and is scalable. Uh, it's certainly not the silver bullet that's going to solve every single problem out there. And, and what about Mac and what about Linux? Probably never going to be on Mac and Linux. Um, but from a time perspective, from a development perspective and a payout, payoff perspective, you have to focus, at least for me, um, where you're going to spend the majority of your time. And that's really where, why it, it's, it's built the way it is. Um, not to say that, that you, you, that you don't need to do Mac and Linux forensics. You have to have that capability, but it's very difficult to maintain three code bases that interacts with the file systems and all the nuances of those different things in the same way. So. No, definitely. I agree with you there. And now I was wondering, is there any advice that you have for new people wanting to become DFIR practitioners? What would be your golden advice for them before they start their journey? Mm, I would say trust but verify, right? I mean, that, that's, that's a good tenet for a lot of things <clears throat> in forensics and otherwise. Just because somebody says something doesn't necessarily mean it's true. Now, over, over time, people have reputations of being credible and all those. That's great. And I'm not saying that you don't start or give people more weight, but if somebody says that something's the way it is, and I understand that different personalities are going to handle this in different ways. Um, do you know what a link file looks like at the hexadecimal level? Do you know what an MFT looks like? Or are you used to just looking at the output of a tool? And so I would try to, to push people away from getting used to how to run tools and start focusing on the underlying data structures. The data structures are going to be the key to proficiency long term. Um, is that going to slow you down initially? Yep, it's going to. Um, but the bill is going to be due regardless of, of how you go about uh, trying to game it to get to that point where you're, you're doing all these crazy things. At some point, you're going to have to go back and spend that time. So let that curve ramp up a little bit more slowly up front, and you're going to be that much better. Do you understand how data gets stored on a hard drive? The difference between little endian and big endian and a 32-bit number versus a 64-bit number. What does that look like on on disk? Uh, all those things, those little tiny building blocks, it's like you can't do high-level math without understanding basic addition, multiplication, the fundamentals. All of those little building blocks that go into computer forensics are going to be seen over and over and over. And so kind of circling back with shell bags again, when I first started doing that, you start, you see a structure and you're like, oh, there's a signature, there's a signature. Now you can see these signatures, <clears throat> not just in shell bags, but they're in link files, they're in other parts of the registry, they're in the, certain things are in the MFT. And so you look at shell bags and you're like, that is forensic gold. Well, there's extension blocks all over the place and they certainly aren't just in uh, shell bags. So think about how nice they are in shell bags, but now I can apply them into other investigative areas. If you don't at least spend the time to get familiar with what that looks like, how do you go about finding them? Now, with that said, I don't expect everybody to jump in there and be programmers and slam out a bunch of code to become a member of some club or anything like that. I'm not talking about getting down to that level, but understanding those core data fundamentals, the data structures, is going to pay dividends for a long time going forward. So the sooner you get into being comfortable with a hex editor um, for one or two artifacts, you don't have to jump into 90 of them at once. You're just going to be that much better off. So that's that's what I would say is start with the basics, learn how to do things manually, and then you automate up. And uh, all too often, we automate, and then very few people go, well, why does that work? They don't care or they don't have the time or whatever, and very few people deep dive. So the people that are kind of either the trainers or the managers, if they have that focus on building good forensic examiners from the bottom up, 
well, then they're going to be automating at that much higher of a level and be able to adjust on the fly more than, well, the, the process is broke. Now, I don't know what to do. And so that's long term. You want to try and build that skill set in. I don't know any other way to do it than to learn those fundamentals as early as possible. I think that it has helped me in my career as well, being able to pass out the MFT manually to understand that my tool was interpreting the dates um, not in UTC, but in local, my local time, which gave me a huge time discrepancy. But once I you know I could determine what the UTC time was, um, I didn't have a problem going from there. But that's knowing my um, timestamps. And that's something that Sans has taught me with 500, which I've completed. Um, and I also enjoy that it's not just tool automation with the courses. And I think that's why I enjoy Sans so much. You, so I'm actually looking forward to seeing 498 in real life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a good course. I think I think you'll like it. I mean, not just because I'm the author, but we really wouldn't do it if it was just like, oh, well, I have nothing in it. I mean, we really want people to learn this and and have it help them change the way they do it. It not replace supplement. Maybe you can adjust your process. If we can if we can give you back four hours for every one terabyte hard drive that you have to deal with. That's pretty good, right? And you, that you're four hours ahead of the game. And now again, if time doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. But when time matters, four hours is a massive amount of time to start making some solid leads and running stuff down to try and, and get to some conclusion much quicker. Um, especially in IR, we always seem to be playing catch up. So, I mean, if you can gain four hours, uh, that, that's a significant change, for example, mm -hmm. you know, for any examiner, because we always after the fact and then having to chase 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 mm -hmm. so definitely triaging faster is only to benefit you as the ir practitioner um, as well as your client that you're working for mm -hmm. um what i wanted to ask is and this is something that i ask everyone is what do you do to relax what do you do when the chase is just too much and you need to switch off um i think we don't do that often enough sure no and it's very easy to get sucked into the the I got to answer the email. I got to, I got to respond on this. I got to, Oh, somebody has an issue. I got to, I'm, I'm as bad or worse than anybody at that. Um, and so you really have to focus and prioritize on work-life balance. I like to play hockey. I like to spend time with my kids. We go swimming, do whatever. Uh, so family of, of course is going to be important getting outside of the house. Personally, uh, I, I play hockey at least once a week, um, pool, Bill, you know, billiards, not swimming in the pool kind of a thing. So I have several hobbies, listening to music, stuff like that, that just disconnects you from what you're doing day in and day out. Um, and if, if I tend to run into this problem when I'm programming more so than other things, but a lot of times you start, when you start looking at a problem over and over and over, your, your, your vision starts getting narrower and narrower and narrower, and you tend to make more mistakes instead of less because you, you get locked in on a certain thing. So a lot of times when you start getting to that point where this nothing's working, I can't figure this out, step back for a while. Maybe you take a completely different approach. I can't tell you how many thousands of lines of code and hours and hours and hours of work that I've thrown away because it wasn't right. The MFT parser is an example. Uh, so there, there's lots of ways where you're just like days and days and days and days of trying to figure this out. And you go, wait a minute. You step back for half a day and then you're like, oh, well, I could just do it this way and it's instantaneous and it just works. And you have 15 lines of code instead of 800. So you got to have an outlet, a hobby, um, something, or you're just going to burn out. And that's something, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not really in the infosec world, but that seems to be a problem, not in just in digital forensics, but in a lot of technology related things, it's just constant. I have a phone, I've got a computer it's very easy to just plug into this to the computer and disconnect from the physical world. Uh, it took me a long time to figure, find out that, find that balance and do those things, but family's happier. I'm happier work products better. Um, it seems counterintuitive, but it's, it's true. So yeah, for me, I would say hockey and, and just family stuff. 
Uh, but thank you, Eric, for being on the show. I really do appreciate it and sure. sharing your journey. And you must have a phenomenal day. And I will speak to you hopefully soon. Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity. Cheers. Bye-bye.